In cellular respiration, glucose, which has the chemical formula C6H12O6, reacts with oxygen gas in the environment to produce carbon dioxide and water. So our bodies use this reaction to generate energy in the form of ATP. We breathe in oxygen gas from the air and we exhale carbon dioxide and water vapor. And this process generates the energy we need so that we can function. Now, of course, cellular respiration takes place in many individual steps. This is just the overall reaction. But in this video, we are going to balance this reaction. This reaction is also known as a combustion reaction. A combustion reaction is basically reacting a hydrocarbon, which may contain oxygen as well, like this one. So you react such a, a compound with oxygen gas and it produces carbon dioxide and water. Combustion reactions are highly exothermic. They release a lot of energy, most of which is in the form of heat. Now let's talk about how to balance this particular combustion reaction. Whenever you want to balance a combustion reaction, my recommendation is to balance the number of carbon atoms first. Notice the amount of carbon atoms we have on the left side. We have a total of six carbon atoms. On the right side, we only need to put one. I mean, we only have one rather. So how can we make the number of carbon atoms equal on both sides? Whenever you balance a chemical equation, your goal is to make sure that the number of atoms are the same on both sides of the equation. So we have six carbon atoms on the left side and only one carbon atom on the right. So if we were to put a one as the coefficient in front of glucose, we need to put a six in front of carbon dioxide because one times six is six, and here there's an invisible one. Six times one is six. So the number of carbon atoms are now equal on both sides of the chemical equation. Now, what element should we balance next? Would you say the hydrogen atoms or the oxygen atoms? My recommendation here is to balance the oxygen atoms last because you have a substance that contains only oxygen. This is a pure element. Whenever you have a pure element in a chemical reaction, it's best to balance it last because you can always adjust that number without affecting any other element. So let's go ahead and balance the number of hydrogen atoms. Notice that we have 12 hydrogen atoms on the left side. On the right side, we only have two. So how can we make this equal? Well, 12 divided by two is six. So to make this equal, we need to multiply two by six and thus both numbers will be 12. So we're gonna put a six in front of H2O so that we now have 12 hydrogen atoms on both sides. Now that the number of hydrogen atoms are equal, we can now balance the oxygen atoms. So in glucose, we have one times six oxygen atoms. In O2, we have two oxygen atoms. In the six CO2 molecules, if we multiply six by the subscript two, that's 12 oxygen atoms. And for water, there's an invisible one, so it's six times one, that's six oxygen atoms. So we need to make both sides equal. On the right side, we have a total of 18 oxygen atoms. How can we get 18 on the left side? We don't want to change this number. However, we do want to put a number in front of O2. So let's put an X here. Six plus two times X is gonna equal 18. If we can solve for X, we can determine the coefficient that needs to be put in front of O2. So let's subtract both sides by six we'll get two X is equal to 12. And if we divide both sides by two, we get X is equal to six. So notice what happens if we put a six in front of O2. Six times two is 12. 
And notice that we have a total of 18 electrons, I mean, not electrons, but 18 oxygen atoms on both sides of the equation. So now this combustion reaction is balanced. So that's one of the most effective ways to balance combustion reactions. First, balance the carbon atoms. Second, balance the hydrogen atoms. And then third, balance the oxygen atoms last. If you do it in that order, these type of problems you'll find are not so bad. So that's how you can balance this particular combustion reaction associated with cellular respiration. Now here's a question for you. What happens if we reverse this chemical reaction? If we do this, what type of reaction do we now have? The opposite of cellular respiration is a process known as photosynthesis. Now recall that the previous reaction, which is known as cellular respiration, this reaction releases energy. It releases energy in the form of heat and also through the expansion of gas. And so this reaction is exothermic because it releases a lot of heat energy. You can also say that it's exergonic because it releases energy in general. Now the opposite of this, as mentioned before, is photosynthesis. If you think about the word photo, photo means light. Synthesis means to build. So in this reaction, we're using light energy to build glucose from carbon dioxide and water. This reaction is endergonic. In order to make it work, you have to put energy into the reaction to get it going. The other reaction is exergonic. When it happens, energy is released. Now you do need some type of spark to activate it. Think of gasoline. Gasoline just doesn't ignite with air by itself. Once you add a spark, then it reacts. So glucose is fairly stable, but once its activation energy is reached, this reaction will proceed, generating carbon dioxide and water, releasing a lot of thermal energy. But in the case of photosynthesis, we need to put energy into the system, and light provides that energy to make glucose. So this process occurs in plants. Plants absorb light energy from the sun, and then they take in carbon dioxide from their, you know, into their stomata, and they drop water from the ground through their roots. And in that process, they produce glucose. And I need to correct this. This should be O2 and not H2O. So plants produce glucose, and they also produce oxygen gas, which we can breathe. And so here we see a system of equilibrium. We consume glucose and we use up the oxygen that's provided by plants, breathing out carbon dioxide and water. Plants, they take in light energy from the sun and then they absorb the carbon dioxide that we breathe out and they pull up water from the roots in the ground to make glucose, which we're going to consume later. And so we have a cycle of energy flowing back and forth between plants and people and animals as well. So those are two important processes that you want to be familiar with if you're taking biology, cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So remember, animals and people, they undergo cellular respiration. They use glucose and oxygen to produce energy, releasing carbon dioxide and water vapor. Plants, on the other hand, they can perform the opposite process, photosynthesis. They take in carbon dioxide and water, using light to produce glucose and oxygen gas, and there should be a two here. Now keep in mind, even though plants undergo photosynthesis, at night they can also undergo cellular respiration. So the glucose that they produce, if they need the energy from that, they can 
react the glucose with oxygen, generating CO2 and water. So plants can transpire water, undergoing cellular respiration if they need the energy. But during the daytime, photosynthesis is the predominant process to uh, build the glucose that they need in order to function properly. So now you have a brief overview of two important concepts taught in biology, photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Just know that these two processes are opposite to each other. Thanks for watching.